The Fourth Lateran Council, called in 1213, was the high watermark for the papacy of Innocent III. The papacy by the early 13th century had become the de facto head of Western Christendom. Kings had bended to its will and had held entire nations as fiefs. So by the end of the Fourth Lateran Council, it could be forgiven if the middle-aged pope felt that as the royal houses lined up to answer his call for yet another crusade, that the centuries-long struggle between the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy was finally over, with the papacy being the single head of a unified corpus Christianum. However, storm clouds were gathering in Germany and France, and within a century, the papal monarchy so carefully built up by Gregory VII and Innocent III would be shattered, paving the way for the division of Christendom itself. So what went wrong? By the early half of the 13th century, Innocent's claims of universal sovereignty had history and the weight of a thousand years of legal precedence on its side. Hadn't St. Ambrose cowed the Emperor Theodosius like some misbehaved schoolboy? Popes like Elenius I and Leo III had maintained, based on the Old Testament, that just as God had created the sun and moon, so too had he created the papacy and empire. And just as the moon reflected the greater glory of the sun, so too was the power of the empire dependent on Christ's vicar on earth. Or put more bluntly by Gregory VII, that it may be permitted to the Pope to depose emperors. Yet by the first decades of the 14th century, the papal monarchy was crumbling. In 1303, the French king Philip IV arrested Pope Boniface VIII on charges of heresy, sorcery, and sodomy. In addition to this outrage, the perennial flashpoint of European politics, the relationship between the papacy and Holy Roman Empire, returned with a vengeance. Only this time, there would be no barefoot penitential march in the snow. The issue was the imperial election in 1313 after the death of Henry VII. Henry had claimed total overlordship of his subjects just prior to his death, which of course elicited a strong rejection from Pope John XXII. There were two main claimants for the imperial throne, Frederick, who was the papal choice, and Ludwig, who was later known as Ludwig IV. It was in this context that Dante wrote his treatise on monarchy, this brief book belonged to a genre of political thought which criticized claims of universal papal authority. As with his contemporary Marsilius of Padua, who was employed by Louis IV to research the historical basis for his claims to the imperial throne, Dante argued that the Pope had usurped his position. Justice is at its strongest only under a monarch. Therefore, for the best ordering of the world, there must be a monarchy or empire. The power of Dante's arguments comes from his turning the Augustinian worldview on his head. The Golden Age under the Emperor Augustus represented a seamless garment that brought peace and prosperity to its subjects. The fact that this empire was headed by a pagan emperor found approval from no less than Jesus, who was born during the Pax Romana. So far from being a stand-in for Babylon, Augustus was the model to be followed by 14th century emperors. Of course, the idea of a world monarchy was just a fantasy just as Innocent III's conception of a seamless corpus Christianum had been in 1214. The factional politics that poisoned relations between the empire and papacy became more pronounced throughout the 14th century as the rise of the nascent nation-state would turn the dream of a unified European monarchy into a nightmare of violent confrontation with the very existence of the papacy in question for the remaining years of the Quattrocento.